Good evening. Okay, we're going to discuss the estrogens today. Um, of course, the drugs that are used as estrogenic agents are analogs of the naturally occurring estrogens. The estrogens are biosynthesized uh, through a process that starts with cholesterol. Okay, so we start with cholesterol. The cholesterol is converted to pregnenolone which can then be hydroxylated at the 17th position to give you 17 hydroxy pregnenolone and that is then converted to your dehydroepiandrosterone dehydroepiandrosterone or DHEA DHEA can be hydroxylated to give you 16 alpha hydroxy DHEA, and then that can be further hydroxylated to give you uh, 16 alpha hydroxy androstenedione, and the uh, 16 alpha hydroxy androstenedione is then converted to estriol, and estriol can get eliminated or excreted in the urine. That same DHEA that you see right here, DHEA can be converted to androstenedione, and the androstenedione, under the action of your aromatase, can be converted to estron. And estron is uh, an estrogen that is available as a drug, of course. So androstenedione can be converted to estrone through the actions of uh, aromatics. And the estrone is then converted to your estriol, which again is excreted through the urinary tract. Now the androstenedione that is uh, produced from your DHEA can be converted to testosterone. And that of course is your primary androgen in the body. So the testosterone can then be converted to estradiol, uh, again through aromatase action. And estradiol is the primary uh, estrogen in the body, uh, and eventually estra, uh, estradiol can go to estriol, which then gets excreted in the urine. So the three pathways always lead to the production of estriol, which is then excreted in the urine. So that's the biosynthetic pathway of your uh, of your estrogen. The most potent naturally occurring estrogen in the body is your 17 beta estradiol. 17 beta estradiol is the most potent naturally occurring estrogen in the body. And if you uh, now, if you place an ethanol substitution at the C17 uh, position, you will get two things. You will get one, an inhibition of force pass metabolism. Okay. Inhibition of force pass metabolism. And then you will also get an increase in potency. And so there's a product that we call EES, ethanol estradiol. EES. So ethanol estradiol is the estrogen preparation, the estrogen component of your oral contraceptives 
that are combination contraceptives. So in other words, you have some oral contraceptives that have uh, an estrogen and a progestin. So those are called combination oral contraceptives. In all of them, the estrogen component is always EES or ethanol estradiol. Ethanol estradiol or EES. Okay. So how does an estrogen work? How does your estradiol, which is the main one, how does it work? Well, uh, to provide or produce its pharmacological action, the estrogen uh, gets into the cell. Uh, and it gets into the cell usually by simple uh, diffusion. So passive diffusion will allow your estrogen to get into the cell. And then the estrogen will go straight to the nucleus because the receptor for estrogens is inside the nucleus. Okay. The, you have two major estrogen receptors. Uh, you have ER alpha, that is estrogen receptor alpha, and you have ER beta, estrogen receptor beta. There is some talk about uh, an ER gamma, but pharmacologically that's really not uh, important. So it's mainly, when we're talking about drugs, we're mainly talking about ER alpha and ER beta as the receptors uh, for your drugs. And those receptors are located uh, inside the nucleus. Uh, those receptors are actually uh, ligand activated transcription factors, LATF, ligand activated transcription factors. So basically, you know, they, they have to provide the transcription of uh, target genes to proteins. And all the effects that you see from the drug will be due to the protein that is produced. So they are ligand activated transcription factors. And those receptors exist, exist as a monomer after the uh, estrogen or the drug binds to the receptor, then the receptor uh, becomes a dimer as opposed to a monomer. So the complexation of your drug or any estrogen with the estrogen receptor uh, gives you what you call dimerization the monomer becomes a dimer. Okay. And so when the uh, drug or your estrogen hormone binds to the receptor in the nucleus, you know, the receptor becomes a dimer, okay? And the dimer or the uh, dimerization process then uh, leads to the binding of your estrogen receptor complex to a portion of the target gene that is called the estrogen response element. So you have your estrogen drug or estrogen hormone binding to the receptor and that complex now binds to ERE or estrogen response element which is present on the target gene. Okay, so that complex now, the ER and then ERE, will recruit some co-activators to the active site of that gene. Okay, and uh, these co-activators have the capability to acetylate histone. So when your estrogen 
your receptor and then your ARE, that complex, when that complex binds to uh, that target gene, uh, you get recruition or recruitment of core activators, and then you will get acetylation of histone. The acetylation of histone will uh, would basically alter uh, your the structure of your chromatin. Okay. Alteration of the chromatin structure will increase the ability of your transcription genes to get access to that active site on the gene. Okay. And one of those transcriptional agents, of course, uh, will be, you know, your um, polymerase. Okay. It will be your polymerase. So when the polymerase gets access to that active site of the gene, then you will get transcription and then the gene uh, would undergo uh, translation and then you get your proteins. So that's the pathway for the mechanism of action of your estrogens. And that same pathway will be true for your progestins. That same pathway will be true for your uh, androgens. So all those um, naturally occurring hormones, they have that same pattern in terms of their mechanism of action. They enter the cell through passive diffusion. They go to the nucleus because their receptors are in the nucleus. And once they bind to the nucleus, you get dimerization. The dimerization will then uh, allow them to attach to the ERE, the, you know, in this case, estrogen response element. There's always some response element. And that will be on the uh, target gene. And then you will see the recruitment of co-activators and sometimes co-repressors. Uh, co okay. So the co-activators can acetylate histone acetylation of histone will lead to the alteration of the uh, structure of your chromatin. That alteration allows your transcriptional agents to have access to that particular active site of the gene. And so you would have transcription of the gene and then the transcription of the gene will lead to the formation of proteins. And the actions you see or the effects you see will be based or will be due to uh, the proteins that are thus produced. Okay. Now, the uh, tissues in the body that have estrogen receptors, some of them are alpha, like we said, and some are beta. And some actually contain both alpha and beta receptors. Whenever you have a tissue that contains ER alpha and ER beta, the ER beta will function as an inhibitor of the ER alpha. So again, when you have both ER alpha and ER beta on the tissue, the ER beta is inhibitory to the actions of your ER alpha. Okay. Now, you have differences in terms of the abundance of your estrogen receptors in the body. Uh, so for instance, ER alpha is abundant in the ovaries, in the vagina, in the uterus, in the uh, mammary gland. Uh, it's also abundant in your hypothalamus, your uh, endothelial cells, and then in your vascular smooth muscles. 
So ovaries, vagina, uterus, hypothalamus, mammary gland, uh, smooth muscles of the blood vessels, and your endothelial cells. That's where your ER alpha is abundant. So ER beta is abundant in, again, the ovaries. So the ovaries have both alpha and beta. Uh, you see a lot of ER beta also in the prostate, in the lungs, in the brain, and in the blood vessels. Okay, so that, those are the locations of your ER alpha and ER beta. Now we mentioned that, you know, the ERA, then E and R, that is estrogen plus receptor plus the estrogen receptor, uh, estrogen response element can recruit co-activators, okay, which can then cause histone acetylation. Now, some examples of those co-activators are what you call SRC1, which means steroid receptor co-activator one. Okay. Another one is cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP response element binding protein, cyclic AMP response element binding protein. And then you have another which, which you see more of in, uh, uh, in progestins, uh, which would be your nuclear, nuclear, that is in the nucleus, nuclear coactivator one, and then nuclear coactivator two. So those are some examples of your coactivators that uh, play a role in the uh, actions or the mechanisms of actions of or mechanisms of action of your uh, estrogens and your progestins. Okay, so now we know how your estrogens work in terms of the subcellular mechanism of action. But your uh, estrogens can produce some pharmacological effects, uh, which can include uh, an increase, an increase in the secretion of some growth factors. So estrogens can increase uh, the secretion of insulin-like growth factor, transforming growth factor, you know, all of those two will be increased by your estrogens. And then some binding globulins, uh, your estrogens would increase uh, the uh, production of, the, you know, the, the synthesis because that goes on in the liver. The hepatic synthesis of your thy thyroxine, okay. The hepatic synthesis of your thyroxine binding globulin and also uh, your sex hormone binding globulin, okay? Um, so those globulins, the, their synthesis will be increased. And if you go back to the lecture on, on your uh, thyroid hormones, when we're talking about interactions between your synthroid and other drugs, we mentioned estrogens. And this is the reason your estrogens would increase production of thyroxine binding globulin. So your thyroid drug will be more bound to that globulin. And so you see less effect of the uh, liver thyroxine. Okay. Um, your estrogens can inhibit these interleukins, interleukin one and interleukin six, and can also inhibit the uh, release of your tumor necrosis factor. 
So the release of interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor will be inhibited or decreased by your estrogens. The estrogens would also decrease the release of your gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus and would also decrease the release of, of your follicle stimulating hormone uh, from the pituitary gland. Okay, so those are some pharmacological effects or actions of your uh, estrogens. In terms of the admin, and with the administration, we always start with the roots of administration. Uh, your estrogens can be given orally, can be given transdermally, vaginally, intramuscularly, intravenously, and topically by inunction. Inunction means rubbing, like when you rub Vaseline on your skin, okay? Inunction means rubbing, R-U-B, okay, rubbing. So, you have uh, those different uh, means of administration. Now, in terms of the oral, uh, you have these agents that can be given uh, orally. Uh, for instance, your conjugated estrogen, which is what you have in premarin, conjugated estrogen can be given uh, pill. Uh, there are two other uh, conjugated estrogens that uh, can be administered orally. One is Enjuvia, E-N-J-U-V-I-A, and the other is Senestin, C-E-N-E-S-T-I-N. -E uh, but we don't really discuss those anymore because they are basically not used anymore. So the main conjugated estrogen that is still available on the market, and that is extremely commonly used is your Premarin. So Premarin can be administered orally, but Premarin we know is also available for intramuscular administration and for uh, intravenous administration. Uh, it is also administered uh, vaginally, uh, as we shall see some uh, examples listed here. So oral administration, those can be given orally. Estrace, estrace is micronized estradiol. So micronized estradiol, that's your estrace. And estrace can be uh, administered orally. Uh, you can also see it given vaginally. Okay. And the Estratab, Estratab is uh, estradiol in the emulsion formulation. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's Estrasol. Uh, okay, Estratab is, of course, administered uh, orally. Uh, that, that is your uh, esterified estrogen, esterified estrogen. Um, not, not commonly used uh, anymore, uh, in fact, I think it was, it was discontinued uh, not too long ago. And menest, menest is also a sterified estrogen uh, that has lost favor because it causes too much of breast cancer as an adverse effect. So, these esterified estrogens we can actually just forget about uh, because they, they cause too many side effects and estratab uh, was removed from the market and menace does not used that often. Then um, ethanyl estradiol, that's that EES that, we, that I mentioned earlier, ethanyl estradiol, you know, with that ethanyl substitution, uh, the C17. So EES uh, used to be available as estinyl, E-S-T-I-N-Y-L, 
uh, that was mainly used in the management of cancer, you know, particularly breast cancer. But that has been discontinued. But you do have generic uh, ethanol estradiol in your uh, oral contraceptives, the combination oral contraceptives. As I mentioned before, DES is the only estrogen component of your uh, combination or of contraceptives. There's one called mestranol, but it gets converted back to EES quickly in the body. Then estropipate. Estropipate, uh, you can see it as OGEN, that's a brand name, O-G-E-N, right here, O-G-E-N. So estropipate uh, can be administered orally. And um, so you have those that we can give orally. Transdermally, transdermally you, can, uh, you can use your mist. That is, um, you can use the ever mist. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, a, a preparation that is used transdermally uh, is Evermist. E, V as in Victor, A, then Mist, M I S T, Evermist. Evermist, you just, you just spray, uh, you know, the product on the forearm, uh, usually just once a day. You can use, you know, one to three sprays, but once a day uh, on the forearm, uh, and it's very good in managing the uh, what you call atrophic vaginitis uh, that you see in, in elderly females. So. That's one transdermal means of administering estrogen. Okay. Uh, another means of administering estrogen transdermally is through a patch. You know, so you have certain patches that uh, that contain, you know, estrogens that can be administered uh, through the skin. So you see the difference between transdermal application and inunction. Okay. For transdermal, you're not rubbing anything in. You spray or you apply a patch. Inunction refers to topical administration, but you rub it in. You know, and, uh, most often your transdermal preparations are for systemic purposes. Your inunction preparations are for more topical, not getting into the bloodstream, not getting into the system. Okay. So transdermally, you can talk about a mist, like uh, ever mist, or you can talk about a patch. And we have different patches uh, that contain estrogens. Um, Minivel, Minivel patch, you have Minivel, then you have Vivel, Vivel dot, uh, you have Esclam, Estradam, and you have Allura. All of those are patches that are administered twice a week on a BI weekly basis twice a week. So Minivel, Vivel, Vivel Dot, Esclam, Estradown, and Allura. Those are given on a twice a week basis. Fempatch, Menostar, Climara, those are administered on a once a week basis. All of those contain just Estradiol. They contain that Estradiol. So from Minivale all the way to this Climara, they just contain estradiol. Ortho Evra is a product 
that is administered weekly, okay, once a week, just like all this uh, pen patch, Minosta, and Climara. Auto Eva is administered once a week, but it contains EES, that is ethanol estradiol, plus norelgestromine. Can type that here. Uh, well, just a minute. Okay. So that's what Auto Ever has in it. It has EES. So all these other patches have estradiol, but auto ever has ethanol estradiol, that is EES plus norelgestromine. And norelgestromine is, is, is a metabolite of nogestimate, you know, which is actually a progestin. And we'll mention it when we get to progestins. So that's what you have in auto ever patch that is administered uh, once a week. Okay, then you have some preparations that are administered vaginally. Okay. And the preparations that you can give vaginally would include Vagifem and Uvofem. Okay, both of them are estradiol tablets. Okay, then the tablet form, Vagifem and Uvofem uh, in the tablet form. And you have um, some that are in the cream form, even though they are administered, I mean, vaginally. Uh, estrace. Estrace comes as a cream that can be administered uh, vaginally. Okay. So we mentioned about its oral administration and then its vaginal uh, administration as a cream. Uh, then uh, your estropipate, that origin, that's a brand name, origin, generic is estropipate right here. Okay, so origin also comes as a vaginal cream. Okay, and then dinestrol. Dinestrol is also a vaginal cream, and it basically contains that estropipate uh, also. Uh, the brand name is Auto Dinestrol, because Auto is a company that makes that Dinestrol. So uh, that would be a vaginal cream preparation. And then you have some that are ring. Okay, you see S ring, FEM ring, Nova ring, you know, those are also administered intravaginally. Okay, the S ring uh, is your estradiol. FEM ring is estradiol acetate, so they are not interchangeable. Okay, S ring is estradiol, FEM ring is your estradiol uh, acetate. And then you have Nuvarin. Nuvarin is actually ethanol estradiol, it's EES. It's EES plus ethonogestrel. Let's see here.
So the the Nova ring is ethyl estradiol, that is EES, plus this progestin ectonogestrel. And that of course is administered uh, vaginally. And you have some uh, products that can be given intramuscularly. Uh, Estron by itself. Uh, there we go. Estron. Estron is administered intramuscularly. Um, actually, it's given intramuscularly only. Okay. The estrogen, which means delayed estrogen, you know, the estrogen is uh, estradiol valerate, V as in Victor, A L E. R A T E. The estrogen is your estradiol valerate. That's the late estrogen, and that's administered IM only, also mainly used for cancer, particularly prostate cancer. And then depogen. Depogen is estradiol cypionate. C Y P I O N A T E. C Y P I O N A T E. So so that's administered intramuscularly only also. So those are the different routes of administration of your estrogen uh, preparations. In terms of the distribution, so we've done A, then D in terms of the distribution, uh, your uh, your estradiol uh, and your estron and even estriol, all those have a very, very short half-life. The half-life are uh, in minutes. Okay. Um, and they tend to bind to that sex hormone binding globulin. Uh, sex hormone binding globulin, right there. Sex hormone binding globulin, sometimes you can see it as sex steroid binding globulin, that is SSBG. So it's either sex hormone binding globulin or sex steroid binding globulin. So that's for your estradiol and these other naturally occurring estrogens like estron or estriol. Okay. So they have very short half-life, half-life in minutes, and they circulate bound mainly to SHBG or SSBG. And they have a little amount that is bound to albumin. But your EES, your ethanol estradiol, you know, with the substitution there, the ethanol estradiol has a longer half-life. Uh, the half-life is 13 to 27 hours. Uh, and the reason is because, remember we said with the substitution, you'll get less force pass metabolism. So in that case, the half-life goes up, you know, so uh, the half-life is 13 to 27 hours, and uh, your EES binds mostly to albumin, not to SSDG or SHBG, okay? So ethanol estradiol, the EES, binds mainly to your albumin, not to SHBG. So that's in terms of uh, the distribution. Uh, in terms of the metabolism, uh, for the metabolism, your EES, you know, ethanol estradiol, uh, undergoes hydroxylation to either 2 methyl ether or 3 methyl ether. The three methyl ether is uh, also referred to as mestranol. 
you have some old uh, oral contraceptives that contain mestranol. Uh, there was something called uh, orthonovum, orthonovum 150, uh, that contained uh, mestranol instead of EES. That's the only one that I told you I uh, would have uh, an estrogen preparation that is not EES. However, the moment you give that orthonovum 150, that is 1 slash 50, uh, it gets converted back to EES in the body uh, almost instantaneously. So, but all the other oral contraceptives, the estrogen preparation in them is epineal estradiol. So that's the metabolism or the metabolic pathway of your EES. Now, estradiol, you know, the major one, the major estrogen. So if you if you give um, estradiol, it can be converted to estron, you know, in the metabolic pathway. So estradiol can go to estrone, and estrone can then go to estriol, and estriol can get excreted in the urine. So that's one pathway for estradiol uh, uh, biotransformation or metabolism. Okay. The other pathway is through conjugation. Uh, your estradiol can undergo sulfate conjugation, it can also undergo glucuronide conjugation, and the products will be excreted in the urinary tract system. Okay, so that's for estradiol, that's the second uh, possible biotransformation mechanism. Okay, so the first one is estradiol going to estron, which then goes to estriol, which then goes out to the urine. The second one is conjugation, both sulfate conjugation and glucuronide conjugation, with the product getting excreted uh, through the urine. The third biotransformation or pathway for your estradiol is actually through the actions of your cytochrome P450, 3A4, 1A2, and 1B1. So estradiol can be oxidized by your cytochrome P450, 3A4, 1A2, and 1B1. And the product of that, the product of that oxidation will be some catechols. Uh, it can form two hydroxy catechols and four hydroxy catechols. Uh, and those catechols will then be acted upon by your COMT the same enzyme that you talked about in your autonomic nervous system, catechol O-methyl transferase, catechol O-methyl transferase. And so through the actions of COMT on those catechols, you will get semiquinones. Okay. Uh, not through that. Um, those catechols can be inactivated by your COMT, you know, can be inactivated by your COMT, or those catechols themselves can be converted to semiquinones. Okay. So the semiquinones that are produced can then give you reactive oxygen species, reactive oxygen species. So when one says that estrogens can cause cancer, uh, this is a major reason because when you have reactive oxygen species, you know, those can attack uh, the genome of the cells and turn a normal cell into uh, a tumor or a malignant cell. Okay. So again, your estradiol can undergo three uh, methods of biotransformation. 
one, it can be converted to estron, which then com gets converted to SKR, which goes out to the urine, so that's one. Two, it can undergo conjugation, you know, sulfate glutaronate conjugation. And then three, it can undergo oxidation, which will be carried out by your cytochrome P450, 3A4, 1A2, and 1B1. You get catechols. The catechols can be inactivated by your catechol O methyl transferase, or the catechols can uh, form semiquinones, you know, which can then yield reactive oxygen species. And this reactive oxygen species can give you what you call nucleophilic attack. A nucleophilic attack of your normal cells, that is the genomes of your cell, and convert a normal cell to a malignant uh, one. Okay, so that's the metabolism. And then E, that is excretion. Excretion, as you see, is just through the renal system. Okay, so that's the ADME. Now, in terms of the indications, uh, you can use your estrogens for managing uh, osteoporosis. Um, and we'll, we'll see some examples. I mean, you can use estrogens for uh, managing osteoporosis either by it themselves, that is estrogens alone, or in combination with a progestin. Okay. Uh, there's a drug that is called Prempro. Let's see here. And that's also listed in your handout. Prempro. And then you also have Prempace. Listed in your handout also. Uh, okay. So you have Prempro, uh, Prempro is actually a combination of uh, uh, Premarin, which is your conjugated estrogen, um, right there, Premarin. So it's a combination of Premarin and your medroxyprogesterone acetate, or MPA, medroxyprogesterone acetate. So you have Prempro uh, that is combined with MPA, medroxyprogesterone. Uh, uh, I mean, you have Premarin that is com combined with your MPA to give you Prempro. Um, you have normal pre regular Prempro, which contains uh, 0 0.625 milligrams of Premarin that is combined with five milligrams of MPA. And then you have another Prempro preparation that contains 0 0.625 milligrams of Premarin, and it contains half the dosage of MPA, that is 2.5 milligrams of MPA. Then you have what is called uh, Prempro Low, okay, and that will contain uh, 0 0.45 instead of 0 0.625, 0 0.45 milligrams of Premarin uh, and 1.5 milligrams of MPA. Okay, that's your Prempro low. And you also have a smaller strength, which is 0 0.3 milligrams of Premarin plus 1.5 milligrams of MPA, medroxyprogesterone acetate. So those ones are called Prempro Low, L-O. Okay. 
and of course that combination is administered you know daily for the month um, but prime phase is a little different for prime phase for the first 14 days of the month the patient is actually getting uh, the uh, premarin okay for the first 14 days it will just be Primarin alone, that is 0.625 uh, milligrams of primary. And then for the last 14 days, uh, the tablet contains your 0.625 milligrams of primary plus 5 milligrams of MPA. So it's like you're freezing it in. First 14 days, 0.625 milligrams of primary alone. Last 14 days, it will be 0.625 milligrams of primarine plus 5 milligrams of uh, PPA, or, I mean MPA, you know, which is your hydroxyprogesterone acetate. Okay. So uh, that can be used uh, for the management of osteoporosis. And it, you know it's also helpful in the management of what I call desomotor symptoms. Uh, that will be symptoms that you see in menopause. So hot flashes, mood changes or mood swings, sweating, you know, uh, all of those are referred to as desomotor symptoms of menopause. So during the lectures, if I just say heart flashes, you know, I'm actually, I'm, I'm using it interchangeably with vasomotor symptoms. And for vasomotor symptoms, you can use Prempro, you can use Prempis, uh, you can, you can use your, uh, on the patch, uh, that's also listed in your handout. Combi patch is estradiol plus norethendron. Norethendron is one of your major uh, androgen, I mean, progestins. Okay. Volvo vaginal okay. atrophy, that is atrophic vaginitis and atrophic vulva okay uh or what you can call vulvo vaginal atrophy uh you can also use that prem pro you can use prem phase you can use combi patch that is that combination of estradiol and norethendron okay um even FEMHART, that's listed in your handout. Also, FEMHRT, that is hormone replacement therapy. That's what HRT stands for. Uh, you can you can use that also in um, the management of your atrophic vaginitis or atrophic vulva, or what you call uh, vulva vaginal atrophy. Uh, prostate cancer, uh, you can use estrogens uh, as palliative, palliative treatment of prostatic cancer. Uh, we've mentioned your uh, estron, which can be used for that when we're talking about parenteral administration, right there, estron. So you can use estrone for that. You can use your uh, your estrogen, you know, also for the palliative treatment of prostate cancer. So the estrogen and estrone given parenterally can be used for palliative management of prostate cancer. Breast cancer uh, in both males and females. 
because men can also have breast cancer. Okay, so in male and also in females, particularly postmenopausal females, you can use hormone replacement therapy involving estrogens for the management of uh, breast cancer. And of course, uh, if you have a patient that is oral contraceptive, you can see estrogen plus progesterone, that is the combination for us that I mean, being used as uh, oral contraceptives. Okay. Chlorosis just means atrophic vulva, V-U-L-V-A, you know, when it is by itself. So chlorosis just means atrophic vulva. So you can have atrophic vaginitis, and you can also see atrophic vulva, which is called chlorosis. Okay. And then hypogonadism. You know, if you if you have female hypogonadism, uh, which can a result from female castration. Uh, you can use estrogens uh, as replacement therapy. Or if you have ovarian failure, the, the ovaries fail, uh, you can use hormonal therapy, you know, hormone replacement therapy involving your uh, estrogens. And then uterine bleeding abnormal bleeding of the uterus uh, can be managed by using your estrogen preparations, particularly estradiol containing preparations. So those are the um, indications for your estrogens. And then for the adverse effects of the estrogens, they are basically things that we, uh, many of us are familiar with. Uh, cancer. Uh, estrogens can cause cervical cancer, and they can also cause endometrial cancer, cervical cancer and endometrial cancer. And with uh, showing you how that is possible it is because of the production of ROS right here, reactive oxygen species, you know, which will come from your semiquinones. Okay, so cervical cancer, endometrial cancer, that would be one. Uh, thromboembolic conditions, that is clotting. Uh, the reason why you can get clotting with your uh, estrogens is because the estrogens tend to increase the hepatic synthesis of your coagulation factors, uh, specifically coagulation factors 2, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So estrogens would increase the hepatic synthesis of coagulation factors 2, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And then estrogens can decrease, can decrease the levels of your antithrombin 3. That's a protein in the body that is called antithrombin 3, number 3. Okay. Uh, that is a protein or a substance that helps us to prevent coagulation. But estrogens decrease the levels of antithrombin 3, so they favor thrombosis. Okay. And then when you look at the lipids, your estrogens can increase, can elevate your triglyceride levels. Okay. Uh, even though they have something that's positive, you know, they can decrease uh, LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, like they say, and they can give you a slight increase in HDL. So LDL goes down, HDL goes up, those are good. 
but estrogens can also increase the levels of triglycerides and that will contribute to their throm uh, uh, thromboembolic disorders that they produce. And it's usually uh, venous thrombosis. Okay, weight gain is same with your uh, uh, estrogens, particularly when a patient or an individual is just starting off uh, your oral contraceptives. You know, you see weight gain, uh, you see a greater incidence of migraine headaches. If the patient already has migraine, it, that migraine will be exacerbated. And you can, the estrogens can also cause just regular headaches. And it's not just migraine headaches, but also regular headaches. Okay. Uh, so that's in the brain. You can they, they can also produce some depression. You know that would be another central effect of your estrogen. I mean adverse effect of your estrogen. So regular headaches, migraine headaches, and depression. They can cause that. Uh, your estrogens can also give you an increase in blood pressure. So hypertension or increase in blood pressure can be seen with these uh, estrogens. On the GI tract, you can have the non-specific ones, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, cramping, and then bloating. Uh, the patient may complain of bloating a lot, B-L-O-A-T-I-N-G. Your bloating, cramping, cramping is another one. So nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, bloating, cramping, those are all possible adverse effects of your estrogens. Infections would increase, you can see increased incidence of both bacterial and fungal growth, which can of course lead to uh, bacterial infections and, and your uh, fungal. Uh, infections. Uh, some gallbladder disease, yeah, you know, gallbladder disease has been reported as an adverse effect of your estrogens. And then, you know, you can have some breakthrough bleeding, uh, you know, vaginally, or, or you can have spotting, and then you can have, you know, uh, dysmenorrhea. So, those are all the adverse effects of your uh, estrogens. And uh, so that will be it for estrogens. We will now look at your anti estrogens uh, quickly. Let's take all of these ones off. All right, good evening. Let's uh, finish the estrogens by looking at the uh, anti-estrogens. Okay, the drugs that are classified as anti-estrogens uh, can be divided into two major groups. Those that would inhibit synthesis of estrogens and those that would impair or inhibit the actions of uh, estrogens at the receptor level. Okay, the ones that would inhibit synthesis would include gonadotropin releasing hormones. Okay, they, they have some anti-estrogenic properties. And you have aminoglutetamide. Aminoglutetamide inhibits the conversion of cholesterol to pregnenolone. So the very first step in the biosynthesis of estrogens, it can be blocked or inhibited by your aminoglutetamide. Then azole antifungals. The azole antifungals like ketoconazole, uh, they work by inhibiting the synthesis of cholesterol to start with. So if you inhibit the synthesis of cholesterol, then you will not 
be synthesizing your um, estrogens because uh, you need cholesterol so you can go to pregnenolone and then all the way down to DHEA, down to testosterone, down to estrogen production. So the azo antifungals tend to inhibit the synthesis of cholesterol to start with. And then you have your aromatase inhibitors. Uh, the aromatase inhibitors you divide into two, those that are steroidal in nature and those that are non-steroidal in nature. So the steroid or the steroidal aromatase inhibitors are exemestin, formestin, and atamestin. So those are steroidal agents, the N in stain, okay, atomestin, actually mestin, eximestin, formestin, atomestin, and then those that are non-steroidal, those ending zoles, uh, anastrozole, letrozole, borozole, and fadrozole. So those are non-steroidal inhibitors of aromatase and if you don't have that aromatase you will not be converting testosterone to say uh, your estradiol and you will not be converting uh, your androstenedione to to uh, estrone okay so those are uh, your agents that would inhibit synthesis and then you have agents that would inhibit the actions of uh, estrogens that it that will work at the receptor level okay and those will include fastlodec you know uh, which is a receptor antagonist uh, and then you have your progestins progestins have some anti estrogen properties and we'll mention that when we deal with the pharmacology of progestins and then of course the serums selective estrogen receptor modulators we've discussed some of those under your uh, osteoporosis lecture the one that we will take as a representative agent for your anti-estrogens will be clomiphene because that is one that is used most often specifically as an anti-estrogen drug. Um, tamox tamoxifen is a serum that is used uh, for breast cancer management, both in males and females. Uh, Terebifen is also used in uh, breast cancer but it's used particularly in postmenopausal patients uh, who have uh, a tumor that is ER positive. That is a tumor that is estrogen receptor positive or estrogen receptor unknown. Okay, so if the tumor occurs in a postmenopausal patient, and that tumor is estrogen receptor positive, yes, you can use teremifen. Or if that tumor is estrogen receptor unknown, you can use uh, teremifen for the management of that breast cancer. Raloxifen, we've discussed under osteoporosis, that's your vista. And basidoxifen, of course, we've also discussed on the osteoporosis. Uh, you will remember that if you give that in combination with conjugated estrogen, that's what you will have as Duave that you use for visomotor symptoms and you also use for the prevention of uh, your osteoporosis. And you remember it can be combined with Abrams for the treatment of breast cancer. 
Okay. Uh, sometimes you can see this Paslodex, you know, also combined with Abrams uh, for the management of breast cancer. Um, and uh, all these arom uh, the, the aromatase inhibitors, all these aromatase inhibitors can also be combined with Abrams for the treatment of breast cancer. Yeah, so you can combine aromatase inhibitors with this drug for breast cancer. You can combine your basidoxifen with it. You can combine your paslodex, paslodex with it uh, for the treatment of um, metastatic breast cancer. Okay, uh, this drug, ospamifen, Hope I put it okay right here. Ospermifen is also a serum, you know, selective estrogen receptor modulator that is mostly used for postmenopausal, postmenopause associated dyspareunia. Uh, dyspareunia is a condition in which the patient experiences pain with intercourse. That condition, dyspareunia. Okay. So uh, if a patient has post, I mean, if a patient is in the postmenopausal state, uh, they can experience some pain, you know, uh, when they try to engage in a sexual intercourse. Okay, so that's that's a drug that is designed specifically for management of this pyrogenia. Uh You give it 60 milligrams PO and it's given with food. So it's the same strength as raloxifen, you know, 60 milligrams PO QD uh, with food. Uh, and so it will help to thicken the vaginal tissue and that would prevent that pain. Um, unfortunately, it can produce a lot of sweating and hot flashes and, uh, you know, thrombosis. Endometrial cancer possible, and, and uh, possibly a stroke. So it does have those adverse effects, but it is very effective in managing dyspareunia. Um, another effective drug for managing dyspareunia is your DHEA, the hydroepiandrosterone that we mentioned in the biosynthesis of your estrogens. You can see DHEA uh, on the market as intra-rosa, uh, intra, I-N-T-R-A, then rosa, R-O-S-A, like rose, intra-rosa. That's, that's a brand name for DHEA, uh, and it's used in the management of dyspareunia. Okay, so. So now we can basically focus on, on um, clomiphene as a representative agent for this group. The clomiphene that you see on the market that is used on the market is actually a racemic mixture of zuclomiphene and enclomiphene. Okay. So, So 
it's a racemic mixture of isoclomethan and clomethan. That's the clomethan uh, that you see uh, on the market. And um, the mechanism of action, well, it uh, tends to increase the output, it increases the output uh, of your pituitary gonadotropins. So you see an increase in FSH, and you see an increase in luteinizing hormone, LH, you know, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Those will increase uh, when you give uh, I mean, clomiphene. Okay, and if you have an increase in FSH and LH, you see an increase in follicular development. Okay, so that's that's how it works uh, in the management of ovulatory failure. Okay, so the patient can get pregnant. Okay, um, but it is also an agent that inhibits the functions of estrogen. That's why we say it's an anti-estrogen, so it can work at the uh, receptor level, okay? And by inhibiting estrogen, uh, clomiphene can actually uh, inhibit the negative biofeedback that would have decreased the levels of FSH uh, in your HPT axis, in this case testis. In other words, normally, you know, you have your hypothalamus that will release your gonadotropin releasing hormone, which will then work on the pituitary so you can release FSH and LH, and <clears throat> those gonadotropins can then work on the testes to produce testosterone, okay? And as we saw in the biosynthesis of your estrogens, when you have an increase in testosterone, you can actually cause an increase in estrogens because your testosterone can be converted to estrogens. So if you have an increase in estrogens, the estrogen increase is supposed to go back to the pituitary level through a biofeedback mechanism and decrease the production of FSH and LH. In other words, the body says, I have enough uh, testosterone and enough estrogen, so no need to produce FSH and LH. And that decrease, you know, uh, is what your uh, clomiphene would inhibit. So if clomiphene inhibits estrogen, then there's no estrogen to give you that negative feedback inhibition of this FSH and LH over here. And so there's nothing to stop the production of testosterone in the testes. Uh, and so the level of your testosterone would increase. And of course that will lead to an increase in sperm count, okay? So if you have low testosterone, you can give clomiphene to give you an increase in testosterone production, which will then give you an increase in sperm count. Okay, so that's the mechanism. It just inhibits that uh, biofeedback mechanism that ex uh, elevated levels of estrogen would have caused. So the indications, again, ovulatory failure because it increases FSH and LH, and then increase in sperm count because it inhibits estrogen. So there's no estrogen to give you, to tell the pituitary gland 
to reduce FSH and LH production. So when there's when that inhibition is removed, you have your FSH and LH increasing testosterone production in the testes, and then you see an increase in sperm count. So that's the uh, mechanism of action. In terms of admin, clomiphene is administered orally. Uh, its half-life is about five to seven days. So very long half-life. And the reason it has a long half-life is because it can accumulate in your adipose tissues. Okay. Uh, which means then that uh, Obese patients that use clomiphene uh, would require a higher dose because the adipose tissue can sequester your clomiphene. And the second reason is because your clomiphene has a very high plasma protein binding capability. So the high plasma protein binding would lead to less free clomiphene being available for work, okay, and then a little bit at a time will be released from the plasma protein binding site, and that's why your half-life will go up. And third reason is because clomiphene undergoes enterohepatic circulation, okay, so it just keeps going back and forth, back and forth. So the high enterohepatic circulation component of it uh, pharmacokinetics uh, is another reason why clomiphene has a long uh, half-life of five to seven days. Okay, in terms of its um, excretion, it undergoes fecal excretion mostly. Uh, a very tiny bit will go out in the urine, but it is mostly excreted through the feces. So we've seen the indications of a failure so the patient can get pregnant and then increase sperm count uh, to manage low T, like we say, low testosterone. Okay, the dosage uh, the, for the first course when a patient is using uh, so they can they can use three courses of treatment. Okay, the first course of treatment you give fifty milligrams POQD times five days. That's for the treatment of ovulatory failure, okay? So that it can induce ovulation. So you start on day three of the menstrual cycle and you give it for five days, okay? And that's for the month. And if that doesn't help, then you go to another round of uh, clomiphene, that is a second course you double the dose. In other words, you give 100 milligrams POQD times five days. Okay. And if that doesn't work, then you go to a third course or round of uh, clomiphene, and the patient will use 100 milligrams again for five days. After that, if it does not work, in other words, if the patient does not get pregnant, if the, if the ovulation is not induced, uh, then you have to try other means of getting pregnant. Okay, because after that third course, if it does not work, it will not work. Okay. Uh, for the adverse effects, or oh, for the uh, um, low T, you just give 50 milligrams POQD. The male takes that. You know, daily until the sperm count goes up so they don't have low T anymore. 
uh, you say that a patient's testosterone is low if it's less than 400 nanograms per deciliter less than 400 nanograms per deciliter is regarded as low T or low testosterone. Okay. Uh, adverse effects, uh, your uh, clomid or clomiphene can produce some vasomotor symptoms. You know, we talked about uh, those, you know, hot flashes and everything else. Okay, it can cause an enlargement of the ovaries and may cause some tenderness of the breasts. On the GI tract, you have your nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, bloating, abdominal distension, and abdominal discomfort. And then uh, centrally, it may cause some headaches, uh, possible dizziness. Dizziness can also occur and some visual symptoms of visual impairment. And then on the skin, you can just have hives or, you know, the, uh, or the carrier. So that will be it for the uh, anti-estrogens. So we'll pick it up from there in class by looking at the progesterones, I mean the progestins taking progesterone as the representative uh, agent. Okay, thank you.